Just so happened over the weekend, I flicked on ESPN and a 30 for 30 doco called The Bullies of Baltimore came on. And knowing that I was about to uh, have a chat to you, I watched all of that. What a brilliant documentary. Yeah, they did a great job. You know, we filmed that back in November and uh, they wanted to take a, a, an inside look as they did on that Super Bowl better than 20 years ago. It was a very unique game. It was a very unique team. Uh, a lot of characters, a lot of character as well. Uh, it was great to see, great to do, and uh, brought back a lot of great memories. And also really poignant, wasn't it, that uh, the goose was in that documentary, but sadly no longer with us. Yeah, it was when you think back on it. And again, he was, as typical, he was kind of the center of attention and the life of the party. And and during the broadcasting, or at least the taping of it, Goose was the first one to reach out and, and mention everybody in the organization. Very much wanted everybody to be a part of it, not just the, the, the front names and and, uh, and the like, but that, that everybody deserved the reckoning from the Models to the equipment manager to Bill Tessendorf, our trainer, across the board. And uh, tragically, we lost Goose just a couple of months after that. Brian, you know, when you think back on it, and I know that you would always get asked this question, and especially, you know, as Super Bowl approaches and that, does it have to be a perfect storm? Does everything have to come together in one season? And that's from the very top of the organization the whole way through. Yeah, it really does. And that's not to just miss it, dismiss it to say, well, it's just fate. Uh, so you might as well just go do what you're going to do, and either you're going to win it or you're not. Uh, but but obviously backed up by a lot of hard, hard work, a lot of commitment from everybody involved. Uh, but, yeah, things do have to align by way of injury, the way the season goes. You know, for us, it was a matter of uh, people forget that during the month of October, we, did, we lost three out of four games, uh, did not score an offensive touchdown. Um, but that actually drew the team together. It can, it can do one of two things. It can split you apart or it can draw you together. And it drew us together and really was the catalyst for us to go on that 11-game winning streak ending up in Super Bowl thirty-five. It's fascinating you say that, um, isn't it? Because watching it and watching the inability of that team to... I mean, look, they could score touchdowns, obviously, on the defensive end. But, you know, when you're a coach and you're going through that, I mean, what was going through your mind? Were you, were you reading tea leaves? Were you trying every single trick there was that you thought of how to actually overcome this? Yeah, you, you, as a coach, it's just what can I do to change this? Because uh, this team is better than that. And it was a team that just really had to find its identity. It was one that uh, e even though we didn't throw the ball particularly well, we were second in the league in rushing, and we led the league in turnover differentials. So those are obviously two huge important. And we had to embrace that identity of what it took for us to win. And when we did, that's when the winning turned around. It's an, an, an amazing documentary. I thoroughly recommend that everyone watches it. This is a, a team that is now etched in history as the greatest defensive team ever in the NFL, conceding only 10.3 points a game. And I wanted to bring that up because a number of comments were made uh, by the players that the game has changed so much. And when you just watch even the little snippets of it, it certainly has, hasn't it? It's certainly, you can't defend like that anymore. You can't play defense like that. No, and that's why I think that record, you know, records are made to be broken, and we see it all the time. But that's one record. I don't think it will ever be broken, uh, simply because the game has changed. And the advent of the great number of quarterbacks we have, the way the game, the, the offensive players are protected. I mean, the league wants offensive points. They want big production. So, yeah, it has changed. And that team, I think, takes a lot of pride in it, because there's going to be a lot of good defensive teams come along. I get that. But that was a very special team at a special time. And I agree, that record will never be broken. Brian Billick is with us. He won the Super Bowl in 2000 with the Baltimore Ravens. Um, and we thank you so much for your time, mate. It's so, so, so generous of you. Looking at these two teams now that have made the Super Bowl, um, I mean, you know, you can't ignore defence. Defence obviously still plays a major, major part. Who's the strongest defensively? Well, it is great, going to be a great matchup. I think Philadelphia is the more physical team on both sides of the ball. I mean, Steve Spagnola, the defensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs, has done a fantastic job uh, in, in doing with what he has and, and obviously augmenting what is a truly dynamic offense behind Patrick Mahomes. But the Philadelphia defense, they are as physical a group as anybody in the league. Uh, the, the key for them is I think they're going to be able to put uh, a four-man rush on Patrick Mahomes that allows them to do more things on the back end and not give up the big play, uh, to not give up plays to Travis Kelsey. I think Kansas City has not played a team as physical 
as the the Philadelphia Eagles, particularly on the defensive side. Okay, and 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 also with his injury as well. I mean, I've, I, all the talk all has to be about that. And watching him hobble on one leg, he can still do some amazing things. It's more incredible to me that he can actually play hobbling on one leg. Yeah, and we saw that obviously in the championship game, and 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 he ultimately was the difference. So he's he's going to be a little bit better, obviously, given a couple of weeks off. But that high ankle sprain really doesn't get healed in a short period of time. So he's still going to be somewhat limited. He'll still run around and make some great plays. Uh, but I think the difference will be, and we thought we'd see it in, in Buffalo, but we did not uh, in the Buffalo game, I should say, uh, or excuse me, in the, in the Cincinnati game, because they do, too, have a fairly physical defense and know how to play the Kansas City Chiefs, have shown that in winning three out of the last four games. Uh, but Philadelphia is a great deal more physical, and I think they're going to be able to do a lot more damage with that four-man rush uh, that I talked about that's really going to test Patrick Mahomes. Brian, did they blow that game, the Cincinnati Bengals? I don't know if they blew it. Obviously, the last play was so regrettable for the young man that uh, the penalty, you know, we don't know what would have happened in the overtime. Clearly, they would not have been able to try the field goal from that distance or would have been imprudent to do that. Uh, at the end of the day, it was a three-point game, and, and you got to give both teams credit. Uh, the Cincinnati offensive line did not perform as well as I thought we, we I think we thought we would see from them, uh, but still they brought it down to the last possession, and uh, it was just regrettable that after making a great stand, stopping them, and clearly was going to force them into a punt, that uh, that a penalty in the way that it did made the difference in the game. You know, you won a Super Bowl with Trent Dilfer as your quarterback. He played really well down the stretch, didn't he? Um, but you know, the, the 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 you know the whole thing about your team that won it was, you know, it's not about the quarterback. Whereas this certainly is a Super Bowl that is about the quarterback. How do you go about? How do you go about attacking both those QBs in this particular game? Well, uh, uh, Trent was the perfect quarterback for us uh, in the sense that. He understood his role. He understood what he needed to do and, and played to that strength, which was, again, rely on the defense, don't turn the ball over, run the ball, and, and that was the formula for us. And for him to embrace that, uh, I think to his credit, was the difference uh, for us in terms of going down to the end of the season, that experience he brought, and playing just enough big plays, that big play, that slant to Shannon Sharp in the Oakland game, uh, obviously was the difference. Uh, was able to make just enough big plays. And then in the Super Bowl itself, a big play to Brandon Stokely down the field and playing good, solid quarterback, all but conservative, good, solid play was the difference between us winning and losing. If you're looking at Jalen Hurts now, and he's a young man, I mean, you know, he's he looks so brilliant this year, doesn't he? But you go to a Super Bowl, this is Patrick Mahomes' third, he's never been 2-1. There's all of that psychological stuff going on. How do you, what what would be your game plan around him specifically? Well, he's used to big games coming out of national championship games and having been around it at, at uh, Alabama and then later in Oklahoma. So the big stage is nothing new for him. Uh, he's going to be fine. It is a Super Bowl, so it is different. So clearly, Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs have an advantage in that regard. Uh, but but I think he'll obviously step up in the moment, and I think his ability to run around and make some plays, in addition to their ability to run the ball and be more physical, I think that's going to be the difference in the game. Are these the two best teams for you that are actually in the Super Bowl this year? They both finished with the best records. No question. Uh, Philadelphia, at the end of the day, I don't think anybody can argue that they were the best team in the NFC. Uh, Kansas City deserves to be there. They won. Now, obviously, it was a very close game with the Cincinnati. Uh, Buffalo was an outstanding team, but they weren't able to finish it off the way Kansas City did. So I don't think anybody can argue that uh, we do have the two best teams playing in the Super Bowl. Brian Billick is with us. He coached the Baltimore Ravens in the year 2000 on the platform and he, uh, to win a Super Bowl. The whole build-up, uh, you know, how did you approach it, given that watching that documentary, The Bullies of Baltimore, you had so many characters in that dressing room, so many leaders it, it looks like you had in that dressing room. Did you let the players kind of dictate a lot of how the preparation went, or were you absolutely hard and fast on exactly every day there was a routine, there was this, there was that, it was all laid out for them? No, I, I, I relied on that veteran. Like you said, we did have a lot of characters, but we also had a lot of character. We had great veteran leadership. Like we said, Tony Saragusa, Shannon Sharp, Trent Dilfer, Rob Woodson on the back end. Uh, just so many guys that, that were very 
focused on, you know, winning a Super Bowl. These are guys that, uh, that you know, they've had the big contracts, they've had the Pro Bowls, but they, they were very focused on the Super Bowl. So, I, you know, I tried to keep them pointed in the right direction, make sure they had the right structure around them, but they clearly were the key in team, terms of holding that team together and making sure everybody stayed focused on exactly what we needed to do to win the game. Tactically, how much time did you spend drawing up what you needed to beat those Giants? Well, you you have two weeks, basically, and, and, and the most common advice I got, whether it was from Bill Walsh or Dan Reeves or other people that had mentored me through my career, was to not, not overdo the preparation because the game plan can become stale. So, yeah, you, do, you put an incredible amount of t- time into preparing and the game planning of what you wanted to do uh, and analyzing what they did. Uh, but you wanted to make sure that you didn't over, you know, you, the first week was more about just getting rested, getting everybody sorted away as to how we were going to approach the weekend in uh, uh, Tampa Bay, which is where we played our Super Bowl. Yeah, we got the game plan installed, did very little on the field until we got to Tampa the following week and then added the physical element to it. So, uh, yeah, it's a great deal of preparation put in. But at the end of the day, you are who you are. They are who they are. It's easy to identify, and you just play to your strength. Brian, how did you kind of prick the balloon to make sure that the players didn't overplay it and, and play the game before they'd play it, if you know what I mean? Well, you try to pay that. That comes to do with the practice and when you get there. And you, you wanted the week to feel as normal as possible, as best you can in a Super Bowl. So you try to keep the same schedule. Uh, you don't overdo it. You don't try to look at that extra film or put in that extra time. Uh, you just want to keep it as normal because we had done this all year long. Uh, had a, su- a successful season, obviously, to that point. Uh, so you want to just keep uh, the practices as normal as possible. Uh, let the players take over with the preparation, be focused, be detailed, but to not wear them out with that because they knew what it was we needed to do in our preparation going into the game. There's a couple of psychological things which I noted, which I, I really, really liked. One of them was uh, when you played the Tennessee Titans, and of course they'd been to the Super Bowl, um, what, the year before it might have been, or do they ended up the year right? Mm-hmm. No, it was the year before, that's right. They lost to uh, they lost to the LA Rams. And you'd held up that Sports Illustrated, which says this is the best team in football. And you, a fantastic quote, you said, well, that might be true. They may be, but not today. But not today. When did that's- that When did that come to you? Yeah, that's that. You know, they were a rival. Obviously, at that time, they were in our division. They no longer in are in the same division. But back then, in the old AFC Central, it was what is now the AFC East with Baltimore and Cincinnati uh, and 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 Cleveland and Pittsburgh. But we also had Tennessee and Jacksonville were in that division, and so they were they were rivals. And we played them twice a year, so you became very familiar, very heated rivalry. Uh, and so now we were going to play them in the playoff game for the third time. Uh, the second time we played them, we beat them in uh, Tennessee, the first time they had ever lost in that stadium, and everybody was hailing them as the best team in the, in the, uh, in the NFL. Uh, well, then after the game, uh, the P- our PR guy, Kevin Byrne, uh, who uh, we called him the fire starter because he, he, he knew how to stir things up a little bit. He came to me after the game. It was a very emotional win for us and, and had showed me the cover. I hadn't seen it. So, you know, did, my natural instincts kicked in at that point. The players were aware of it and took great pride in knowing, hey, we went, we went into the Lions then, we went into Adelphi uh, uh, Stadium in Tennessee, and we beat the quote-unquote best team in the NFL. We were kind of staking our ground as to, well, maybe not so fast, maybe we're the best team. Also, well, you know, and I, I, I'm a big fan of Sir Alex Ferguson and the way that he used to deal with the media. By he, he used to do a lot of things where he'd take the pressure off his players, the Man United manager, by by becoming the focus. And when you were at that press conference and you had a lash at the media about uh, regurgitating the stuff around Ray Lewis, was there was there a bit of tactics in that as well that you became the villain for the media and the focus went on you? Yeah, to a degree. Uh, you know, we had lived it all year long. Uh, from training camp to all every uh, game, particularly we'd go on the road, every road game. You open the paper that Sunday morning when you sit down to have breakfast, and there was going to be a picture of Ray Lewis in the orange jumpsuit and reliving and regurgitating the same thing over and over again. So when we got to the Super Bowl, um, uh, and we'd had a pretty good week leading up to it, but when we got to the Super Bowl, I didn't think that was going to be an issue. I didn't think... You know, I thought, okay, this has been done and over and, and no big deal. Well, sure enough, the media 
particularly the night before uh, uh, a couple pieces, really jumped all over it. And so uh, the mindset for me going in was, look, what, what, what did I just say? We're trying to keep the week as normal as possible. We had fought this all year long. So I just kind of staked our ground saying, look, we're not going to redo this. As much as you want to ask, we've been through a whole season of this. We're focused on the game, so we're done with it. And just kind of laid the marker to let them kind of, okay, come after me if you want um, to just deflect a little bit from them dealing with the players. Brian Billick is with us. A couple more questions, if it's okay. I'm just so, just so enjoying talking sure. to you. I'm very conscious how much time we're taking up of you, though. Is it, I mean, obviously it's fun. You won, so it's fun. Is it a fun week, though? And how, you know, could you imagine looking back on it if you hadn't have won and you never got another chance? Because I suppose, Brian, everyone thinks, oh, we can always make another Super Bowl, but that's not the case, is it? No, it's not. And, and to look back for those teams and you visit with those people that have gone to that game and lost, it's gut wrenching because you you know you're there because you think you're a team of destiny, you think you belong there, you think that you're there for a reason, and that's to win the Super Bowl. And when then it doesn't happen, that leaves a mark. That 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 emotionally hit. That's why so many teams that go to the Super Bowl and lose actually struggle the next year. Uh, but for us, obviously, the week it was a phenomenal week with some great memories. The team stayed incredibly focused uh, and and had the task at hand. Uh, right from the get-go, and uh, and so obviously, and and the fact that we knew by about the middle of the third quarter we had that game in hand. You know, it's rare that that you you, you have that realization. Typically, it's right down to the end, and it's very. But you had the last quarter and a half, so to speak, to kind of look around and and recognize just what was happening and take in the moment. That made it all that much more special. What happens on on Monday New Zealand time then Super Bowl? Uh, how do you call this one? Is it is it is it is it that close between these two teams that it could just come down to one or two plays? Yeah, I think you see the the line of the, of the bookies. They got it at one or one and a half, which that tells you that they think it's close, obviously. And and uh, uh, I think it is going to be very close. I think, as I mentioned earlier, the physicality of the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, notwithstanding the, the somewhat limited mobility of, of uh, Patrick Mahomes. But I think the combination of the physical defense, the ability to stop the run and get pressure on the quarterback with just that four-man front that allows them to do the things on the back end, and the fact that I think Philadelphia has the chance to be physical with that front seven of the Kansas City Chiefs, run the ball as they have all year long, you add on the 40, 60, 80 yards that Jalen Hurst is going to put on, particularly in critical situations, uh, that now makes you come down and build the box. It's going to open up the big play opportunity on the outside. I think Philadelphia and their physicality is the difference in this game and that they're going to win it. What is the one piece of advice that you might have, or it may, it may not even be advice, if, if either coach rang you up, if Andy Reid rang you up, and they just said, hey, Brian, I just want to pick you, Brian. We've got a few days to go. Give me something. What would you say to them? Well, like the what was, was advised to me along the way, you, you just let, you know, let the natural course of the game come to you. Don't make the game, obviously the circumstances you can't avoid, as being truly unique and spectacular. But the game itself, and I think the players in most instances will tell you, once the ball is kicked off, then it just becomes a game. Now that's our domain. We're familiar with it. We know what we're doing. Don't make it more than just that because you've gotten to that point because you've handled the process properly and just let the game come to you. Don't make it more than what it is, a game that you're very familiar with and you know how to win. How often do you look at that big, shiny gold diamond thing on your finger, mate? Yeah, it's pretty good. I, cool. I don't wear it a whole lot. of you know, I do uh, uh, speaking engagements and the like. It's great fun to watch people react to the ring, though. Even if they're not football fans, it's something special. They know it signifies something special. And uh, it's it's kind of fun to have. You can't guess. Do you, do you really feel like what it means is that it can never be taken away from you? It's etched forever? Well, exactly right. I'm usually introduced as a former Super Bowl winning head coach. And I have to remind them, well, no, I'm pretty much still a Super Bowl winning coach. They don't take it away from me <laughs> after a while. You got to you gotta remind them of that occasionally, you know, and so you kind of knock your knuckle on the table a little bit with the ring. Uh, but but it's all in great fun, and it's it's fun to watch people react to it. Who wins it then? 
Oh, I think it's Philadelphia. Now, again, you can't discount Patrick Mahomes and, and how special he is. And if anybody could pull this off, it's going to be Patrick Mahomes. Uh, that's the great thing about this game. It's, it's, it, the, the founding fathers found it a long time ago. It's not the best team that wins the game. It's the team that plays best. And certainly Patrick Mahomes and that group have the pedigree. They have the ability to, to, to obviously pull the game out. But when you look at it analytically, player for player, I think the physicality of the Philadelphia Eagles, I think the Eagles win. We thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Ron Barr's a really good old mate, and he uh, helped organize this for us. So we thank him, and we thank you so much, Brian. Good on you. Glad, glad to do it.